Let us listen to the second lesson for this morning. It's taken from the book of Judges, chapter 7, verse 1 to 8. Then Jerubai, that is Gideon, and all the troops that were with him rose early and encamped beside the spring of Herod. And the camp of Midian was north of them, below the hill of Moreb, in the valley. At last the Lord said to Gideon, The troops with you are too many for me to give the Midianites into their hand. Israel will, have, will only take the credit away from me, saying, My own hand has delivered me. Now therefore proclaim this in the hearing of the troops. Whoever is fearful and trembling, let him return home. Thus Gideon sifted them out. Twenty-two thousand returned, and ten thousand remained. Then the Lord said to Gideon, The troops are still too many. Take them down to the water, and I will sift them out for you there. When I say, This one shall go with you, he shall go with you. And when I say, this one shall not go with you, he shall not go. Then he brought the troops down to the water, and the Lord said to Gideon, All those who lap the water with their tongues, as a dog laps, you shall put them to one side. All those who kneel down to drink, putting their hands to their mouths, you shall put to the other side. The number of those that lapped was 300, but all the rest of the troops knelt down to drink water. Then the Lord said to Gideon, with the 300 that lap, I will deliver you and give the Midianites into your hand. Let all the others go to their homes. So he took the jars of the troops from their hands and their trumpets, and he sent all the rest of Israel back to their own tents, but retained the 300. The camp of Midian was below him in the valley. The word of the Lord for the people of God. We'll say amen. Please pray with me. Let the words of my mouth and the meditation of our hearts be acceptable before you, our God and our Redeemer. Amen. So greetings to all of you mighty warriors. Where's Plymouth? And those that are joining us, I'm sure you're roaring and all I wave at us so we can say hello to you. I'm using your microphone. I'll return it next week, so don't worry. I want to share this amazing account of a person that used to appear like any of us in the surface, very unlikely, uh, different than any other human being. Gideon is a story of weakness and strength, and Gideon goes definitely from weakness into that beautiful strength that we call faith, becoming useful to God very much and to the plans of delivering them. So after the time of Moses and after four centuries of plus captivity in Egypt, and after the time of Moses and Joshua, as Moira, Pastor Moira beautifully said earlier, we see a range of what we call the judges is right plugged into the Bible in that area. But let me start our story in our morning by saying what, or repeating very yet, what is in verse 1 of chapter 6. So we kind of set up this, this story as why are the Israelites in trouble. So chapter 6, verse 1, it says, The sons of Israel did what was evil in the sight of the Lord, so the Lord gave them into the hands of Midian for seven years. For seven years they were worried by the Midianites and the Amalekites and Midian Amalek were basically 
pushing them down. Simply put, it was kind of a cycle, rebellion, punishment, deliverance. Rebellion, punishment, deliverance. And it took the entire, it takes the entire book of Judges, and this happens in there seven times. Almost every generation that is, is placed in there over and over falls short of what the Lord wants for them. But let's begin looking at Gideon, which is the task that we have at hand. So we already heard for, for seven years, they were struggling, they were terrorized, they were, they were ocelot, and these two group of people basically raided the entire Israel land and destroyed their crops, stole their livestock, they killed people. So no wonder when we find our beautiful character, he was where? Hiding, right? He was not out and about, he was hiding. He was actually using the wrong tool for the task at hand. Are you with me? Yeah. Yeah. Good. So the choir said yes, yeah, so that gives me some energy to continue. Come on, guys. So we'll see Gideon in there. So I'm not preaching to the choir, I'm preaching to all of you guys. So well, Gideon kind of doesn't get it, and let's get into the story. Gideon doesn't panic, he's not afraid, he's not terrified, he doesn't fall into a dramatic sleep. So this is a different story when God shows up. Instead, this guy, so cool, has a conversation with the angel of the Lord. I mean, isn't that kind of cool? Yeah. It is cool. So he takes his very, very nonchalant, no disrespect there, no disrespect. So the Lord appears as a man and he says, Gideon, the Lord is with you. Plymouth, the Lord is with you. Plymouth, the Lord is with you. Praise be to God, <laughs> Praise be to God says Pastor Moira. Thank you, Pastor Moira. <laughs> and then Gideon humbly said, If the Lord is with us, then why all of this is happening? I don't understand. I don't understand. Where are all these miracles which our fathers told us? You know, those miracles, the ones from Egypt, the plagues, the miracles of the parting sea, the miracles of the water, the miracles that water came out of the rock, the miracles of manna, where are all those miracles? Where are they? The Lord has abandoned us. How sad. For a talented, faithful man to say that. The Lord has abandoned us and has given us into the hand of the Midianites. The Lord, if the Lord, if the Lord is with us, something is off in here. Something is not computing, something is not right. And then the angel of the Lord had to be the Lord, of course, in verse 14, says and turns to him and said, Well, actually, I came to talk to you because you will deliver them. Hold the phone. Hold the phone. What? <laughs> deliver who? You will deliver Israel, my friend, from the enemy's hand. But beautifully... God also says the following, I will be with you, 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 no matter what is the crisis, no matter what is the problem, no matter what is the plague, no matter what is the situation, I will be with you. So this doubting person that we are looking at, the mind's a sign, a sign from God. And in verse 21, the Lord is so gracious, so humble, that he gives him a sign. So he, so he said, well, can you, Mr. Angel, Mr. Lord impersonated, wait for me here. I'm going to bake some bread and get some meat um, and uh, Imagine the Lord, you know, he shows up, starts talking to Gideon, 
And he says, hold the phone. I, I'm, I need to do some cooking. <laughs> so I want to really make sure that this cooking is, is what will give me the sign that I'm looking for. So remember, ladies and gentlemen, this is no air fryer, no conventional oven, no microwave, no way to cook a meal fast. So I'll imagine the angel of the Lord doing this trick. <laughs> waiting, waiting, and probably doing this. Wait, no Apple Watch either. <laughs> so he kindly and humbly waits for him. He brings it, and we heard that he touches and it gets consumed in fire, and then he realizes Guess what? It was true. I was talking to the, to the very young man that saved all of us. That's the sign. So in verse 22 and 23, Gideon gets it. Gets it. And we read, Now Gideon perceived that he was before the angel of the Lord and said, Oh my God. Oh my God. He was talking to me. Now am I going to die because I've seen the Lord face to face? He says, Chill out, man. Chill out. Calm down. I'm coming to give you this message. Peace be with you. Do not fear. You shall not die. So moving forward in our story. I'm looking at the watch here. So moving on our story. It says Gideon summons men. And we hear that he calls them and tells them we need to fight. Enough is enough. Enough is enough. So remember, this is a volunteer army, and 32,000 men respond. 32,000 volunteer warriors. So the guy had to have some leadership, right? To get this up and running. But Gideon, in the bottom of his heart, like all of us, he still is afraid. And we didn't read this part, but he actually goes in verse 36 and 40 and says to God, Would you deliver Israel? If you deliver uh, Israel through me as you have spoken, I'm going to ask you for another sign. I'll put a fleece of wood on the trash, threshing floor. Is there a, if there is dew on the fleece only and it's dry on the ground, I'll know that you will deliver Israel through me. As you have spoken, and it was so, and it was so. And he arose early the next morning and squeezed the fleece and drained dew from the fleece. And a bowl full of water came out. And then Gideon said, God, don't you be angry at me. Don't you be mad at me. Don't let your anger burn against me. Could you just do one more? One more. I'm sure God was saying, are you kidding me? <laughs> are you kidding me? And then he says, um, let's do the opposite. Let's make the test once more with the fleece, but let it be dry only on the fleece and let there be dew on the ground. And God, you know what? God did that night, that very same thing. And it was dry on, on, only on the fleece. And dew was all over the ground. So here is the other message. The Lord consents. The Lord will go above and beyond the call of duty. Will go the whole nine yards if he is after to convince your hearts and increase your faith. He will do anything that we will request if he is after winning our hearts for him. So he continues to be fearful and afraid. It's only human. I mean, the task that this guy had in front of him was tremendous. So in verse 7, we see, in chapter 7, verse 2 and 3, we see that the Lord turns to Gideon and says, you know what? I've done this testing quite a bit of time. Let's get down to business. Let's, let's, let's get this ball rolling. And uh, I want for you to take these 32,000 men that you assemble and that you invited. 
and downsized your army. Gideon turns around and says, you say what? You say what? Yes, downsize your army. Because God's victory comes with a strange strategy. And Israel will not win by conventional armies or forces. Israel will win like we will always win out of con unconventional victories and strategies because God is the one that is walking in front of us, around us, and sustaining us. So Gideon is seriously terrified. His, how, his power has been reduced from 32 to 300, as we, we heard, and that's a significant kind of reduction. Just the numbers, let's think about that. God gave him a, gave, gives him a last sign to calm his nerves. And at this point, I already reached the 1,200 words that I was allowed, so I'm in borrowed time. He asked the Lord, and he says, okay, I'm going to put the last, the last part of this conversation into, into bringing it home for you. Sneak into the Midianite camp. He said, what? Gideon responds. Yeah, go and sneak into the Midianite camp. So he does it in the middle of the night, and then he listens to two soldiers on the, on the enemy's camp, and in their own voices, they express how fearful they are, how deeply fearful they are of this Gideon guy and the army that is encamping around them. So finally, here's the tipping point of transformation in Gideon's faith, and he said, now I get it. Now I get it. Now this has been confirmed. So he turns into the battle, and then we heard that he divides the army into 300, 100, 100, 100, goes into the night, and then the trumpet sound, they smash the pitchers on the ground, and then with blazing torches, they advance against the enemy, shouting the, the sword of the Lord. And Gideon is here, sort of blasting these trumpets and doing all of these things and yelling soldiers. And the Midianites wake up in the middle of the, of the night, dazzled and disoriented and half sleep and, and in panic. And they start slashing their own army to escape. And they, then Gideon wins the battle. As a result of this, the Israelites want to make Gideon king, but Gideon respectfully declined and says, the Lord is the true king. All the credit goes to him. So I only have three minutes. <laughs> My friends, fear should be a thermometer. So we are navigating treacherous waters. We call that COVID-19. But fear in this moment is an invite for all of us to prepare. It shouldn't be a paralytic for our faith. Fear is the right thing to do and go before God as an agent that God bonizes changes, changes around us. Fear is not an excuse for inactivity. It's a motivator and a sign for us to prepare and increase our faith. You, we, all of us have been commissioned to have a vocational shift about our fear and to make alliances with God's truth and promises. Let's don't talk behind the truth. We are leaders. We are to set the example. We need to embrace a vision, a faith that we can take to the public square. Our faith is deeply personal, but it's in private. We're called to witness. We're called to be the light. We're called to be the salt. We're not to be isolated. There is no healing, my friends, 
without touching. So go and touch the world. Here's my final words. My fi these are for my final words taken from 1 Peter 2.9. You are a chosen people, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, God's special possession. And to this we say, Amen.